Hi everybody, I'm Rick Hansen and uh, here for the Foundations of Wellbeing related to the confidence pillar of practice. And it gives me a great deal of pleasure, uh, both personally and professionally, uh, to be able to be speaking here with Dr. Paul Gilbert, who is the founder of Compassion Focused Therapy, as well as a major scholar, writer, therapist, trainer, and all around good guy. Uh, when it comes to um, integrating uh, the knowledge about the brain and evolution and very practical approaches, especially related to growing a sense of self-worth and healing uh, toxic shame. You know, why has it been important for you personally to develop inner strengths, psychological resources, mental resources of various kinds, since that's the focus of the Foundations of Wellbeing program? Why has it mattered to you? Well, I think it matters for a lot of reasons. Um, one of the reasons is the fact that we now know that the human brain is trainable, just like the body is trainable. You can train the mind, and in training the mind, you can change your brain. So it just makes a lot of sense that because our brains are often very chaotic and a bit of a mess, as you know, we call it a tricky brain, that if we learn to train the mind, it's more likely to, to kind of uh, function in the way that we want it to. So, for example, your mind is like a garden, right? It, it will grow, come what may, uh, if you don't do anything with it. But if you train it, if you cultivate certain things within your garden, then you may prefer the result than if you just let it uh, become whatever uh, it becomes by accident almost. So training the mind is essential, really, for helping us deal with some of the difficult emotions and experiences that go on in, 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 in it. You've developed a very powerful framework um, that has three primary aspects to it related to the evolution of the brain as a way of thinking about three interacting uh, systems in the mind-brain process uh, rooted in evolution and that have a lot of implications for how we can get hurt and how we can get healed. Uh, if you will. And so I kind of wonder if you could walk us through each one of those uh, three systems and how they work together and uh, and then we'll start talking more practically about what people can do with this understanding. So the three systems then are threat, which are designed to take over, drive does the same thing to a degree, and the soothing system however is the system which actually helps balance these two. Using your model now um, and I've seen pictures where you kind of draw that out with cross arrows, you know, let's say we have in your model threat, let's say, and a, you know, reward seeking and then affiliation, social experiences. And I use language like safety, satisfaction, connection. But anyway, how is that system related to the development of feelings of inadequacy yeah, or shame or depression all kind of mushed together? And then uh, we'll get into how to use your model uh, in the healing process uh, and the acquisition of greater and greater confidence. Okay, so here's an interesting, here's an interesting thing, right? Um, about two million years, humans started to get smart, right? So, um, and we often use the example of the zebra running away from the lion and then the, the zebra gets away. And once they're away, that's the end of the anxiety. They can't smell it, they can't see it, they can't hear it. So there's no stimulus driving the threat system. Yeah. But humans, because they have this two million year old capacity for thinking, reflecting, monitoring, they start thinking. Yeah, well, supposing I had fallen over, then I would have been caught. And can you imagine being eaten alive by a lion? Oh my God, it's just terrible. Oh my God, I just, oh, can you imagine? And what about if there are two lions tomorrow? And then, well, why did I come and live in this godforsaken place anyway? It's full of lions. What a stupid ass I am, you know? <laughs> round and round and round we go because of this stuff, right? So what's the, int the interesting point is that a lot of what happens with loss of confidence is that we undermine whatever confidence we may have. It's not creating confidence, it's stopping to uh, stop undermining your confidence. Right. One of the things that we humans evolved is a self-monitoring system. The ability to monitor your actions, your thoughts, everything about you at any point in time. So you'll never see a chimpanzee sitting under a tree, taking their pulse, monitoring their body, thinking, oh my God, I'm going to have a heart attack. Doesn't happen, right? You'll never, as far as we know, see a chimpanzee 
sitting under a tree thinking, do you know what, I really messed up yesterday. I bet all those chimpanzees over there really don't like me anymore. What the hell am I going to do? Uh, I've got to try and get my reputation back. It just doesn't happen, right? Humans have an amazing capacity for monitoring just about everything. And that monitoring system, sometimes it's linked to the default mode, but that monitoring system is the system that actually can begin to cause you a lot of trouble because the way in which you monitor is you're monitoring that actually there's a problem rather than you're doing okay. So when you're driving in the fog, you're monitoring yourself, but you're able to think, well, I've done this before, it's okay, I know what I'm doing, I'm quite happy. Whereas if you're monitoring to up the level of danger, and to undermine your driving ability, oh my goodness, I've never done this before, and isn't this where people crash? They crash in the fog. What happens if somebody's not driving with any lights? What am I going to do then? Then that starts to undermine your confidence. So this is where self-criticism becomes very important because people often monitor themselves, and because the threat system tends to be focusing on the negative, what you call a negativity bias, if you're not careful, it'll automatically start monitoring you for what you're not doing, how badly you're doing, where all your problems are. Just like the uh, Christmas shoppers, instead of monitoring all the good that you're doing, it'll start monitoring where the threats are because that's what the threat system is designed to do and therefore that is what undermines whatever confidence you might have. So it's coming back to the points that you make so brilliantly well in your books really, is learning how to notice this self-monitoring system and how it naturally tends to monitor mm -hmm. the problem the deficit, the difficulty, because that's what it's designed to do. But that's not what you want it to do. So how you take control over it and start to focus on what you would call focus on the good, focusing on what you can do, rather than letting your self-monitoring system undermine your confidence. If you stop undermining confidence, confidence will naturally grow. So Paul, again, my gratitude to you and respect and appreciation. And thank you for uh, having this conversation with me. It's my great pleasure. and. Uh, well done for all the wonderful work you're doing, Rick. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you. Bye-bye.